The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so uh, Alan Turing, uh, thinking machines is just part of the romance of science fiction. I mean, science fiction has always been fascinated with the idea that you know you could build a you know a, a, an amazing computer that could somehow uh, think and maybe outthink us. And so uh, this has been a fascination of uh, science fiction writers and writers in general. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to just uh, look at Turing's paper, read Turing's paper, talk a little bit about Turing, uh, so that we get up into the modern era before we jump back into the 19th century, just to sort of... So, yes, Alan Turing. Alan Turing was... Uh, <coughs> does anybody know anything about... Has anybody come across Turing's work before? Devin. What do you uh, He was one of the most interesting people of this time period, for sure, and arguably of the 20th century. He you know, worked on all the Enigma codes, did an amazing, amazing um, work, you know, went on and started to really think deeply about a lot of, you know, coming out of that, about a lot of the issues of what machines could do. Mm -hmm. um, he was a champion marathon runner. Like, yeah. He was a really remarkable athlete as well, yeah. so he was seemingly the perfect kind of yeah. you know, person to do this work. And, Published all this great work, which we'll talk about soon, and then in his his personal life is what kind of where yeah. things got a yeah. little confusing and weird. You know, obviously you see at the bottom there was 1954 there was a suicide, yeah. and the story revolving around it is is a little you know strange. When he was suspected of he was suspected of having homosexual relations with uh, some colleague or something mm -hmm. like that, and the government you know got word of this, and because of all the you know classified work he was doing, that from what I know they started putting him on estrogen. Because that's, that's just, just the thing, thing you do in his body, body, you know. I don't know if you want me to stop anybody, but. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and he, uh, and he, he was put on estrogen, and, you know, obviously the body totally, his body totally flipped out on that, and he became really depressed, and for one reason or other, he committed suicide, whatever, no one, the, the story isn't true, but from what I know, when they found him, there was a bitten apple mm -hmm. on, on the ground next to him, reminiscent of Snow White. There's some controversy. Is it, did he poison himself as a metaphor, or was the cyanide found in the apple just from the normal cyanide that are in apples? You know, so it's all kind of a hoo ha, very fantastic story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Brilliant ending. So great. Well, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's a good intro. Uh, yeah. So Alan Turing was uh, a, a very uh, uh, precocious and and um, uh, highly uh, intelligent person who really absorbed computing in a, in a deep way. Uh, I mean, he, he knew all kinds of things that uh, were ahead of his time. And uh, he came up through the ranks uh, through uh, Cambridge. And uh, he began to work uh, in the Second World War on cracking the uh, code of the German Enigma machine. And uh, so this was his, uh, one of his first great projects. And uh, in order to, in order to uh, study the Enigma machine, uh, one of which had been actually secured, uh, they created another machine. And uh, the Poles, uh, Polish uh, Bamba, it was called. <coughs> and the idea was to use a machine to try to emulate another machine in order to crack the codes. And so, uh, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting, interesting topic, so if anybody wants to write a paper on this, this it would be most welcome. Uh, but uh, the short of the story was uh, they were trying to uh, crack the code using another machine of uh, even greater complexity that could theoretically outperform the target machine. And so this, uh, this became one of the one of the key strategies, 
And it also led to uh, the development and the conceptualization of uh, uh, digital computers as universal machines. The idea of one uh, that uh, a machine could be developed that could emulate other kinds of machines. And that uh, eventually, if you begin to uh, uh, advance in this field uh, and develop more and more complex machines, you could continually uh, get uh, higher and higher performance out of these machines. So the, the, the notion of the uh, universal machines. So as he said in a 1947 uh, uh, paper, we're trying to build a machine to do different things simply by programming rather than by the addition of extra apparatus. So the concept that you know, the, the, the key to the complexity of the machine was in the programming itself. That programs could be made that could do all kinds of uh, things. Um, OK, so I thought it would be interesting to read this paper because it is, uh, let me just say a few other things. Uh, some of you probably know a lot of this stuff. You may not. Uh, uh, there was the whole development of um, <coughs> the, the modern architecture of computing. Uh, and uh, a lot of this uh, was referred to as uh, von Neumann architecture, which was uh, worked out in this kind of a basic logical uh, arrangement. And uh, this is a standard, or, uh, it, it certainly was uh, the core of the early computing machine, the early uh, digital computers were organized in this way. And a lot of this came out, uh, was developed in the 30s and 40s. Uh, so it's a fairly extensive. Uh, Turing himself starts his paper with, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Uh, and of course, he was uh, basing his, uh, uh, his interests in the fact that large computing structures had been developed, uh, big computers had uh, been uh, put together, designed and, and uh, built. And some of these, uh, there, are, there are a whole variety of these. I mean, there's, there are whole histories of computing, so I don't intend to go into that here. But one of the famous ones was uh, ENIAC which uh, was built in 19, was operational in 1945. Uh, and it was huge. It was, that's what, computer like this can be pretty much put into a little tiny device now, uh, as everybody knows. Uh, okay, so he uh, begins his paper with the notion of the imitation game. So what is the imitation game? And why is it, why is it uh, important? Or is it important? <coughs> David? It's the game where um, there's three people, one person's asking the question, they're trying to guess who is male and female. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of like a barrier between the three people. Oh. And <coughs> it's only based on the, the language um, that the questioner can decide whether one person is a male or female. And then um, Turing brings in the notion, like, why don't we um, substitute one of the two people answering with machine, and whether that machine can correctly, like, imitate that person um, in a way that, and if that machine can do it, then it can think. Like, it sort of changes the question, can machines think, to can a machine, like, in a good way, like, play the imitation game well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay. Any further? Claire? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Uh, why is this? Yes, Chris. Oh, it's just that the response of the machine had to be given in text form in order to, to test the machine's thinking instead of just the way it renders um, thinking to audio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is he doing that? Why, why is he, what's the reason for that? In order to put in a, 
and it's at an even footing with the human in terms of thinking. Okay. So he's trying to reduce even by even footing, uh, reduce bias uh, or uh, eliminate uh, uh, sort of preconceptions, if possible. Why is this uh, an important question? Who cares? <coughs> Why does Turing seem to care? Jake. think but think well enough to convince someone that they're a person not just uh, a robot basically I mean, so is he I mean is this uh, try to get equal treatment for robot <laughs> why 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 would anybody care about something like this Devin? well one thing I was gonna um, bring up with this is that he, I think he understands perfectly well that if you ask can machines think you're just going to get people bantering back and forth for, until, until the cows come home, and you're not going to get anywhere. So he says, let's rephrase the issue, and I'll tell you what. If I, put you in front, if I put you in front of this terminal, and you have a conversation with two people, and you are unable to tell me which one is the machine, then that's as good as an answer to me affirmatively. You know? yeah. And he may put, sets it on a practical footing. So it's like, let's not talk philosophy here, because history has shown we're not going to get anywhere. So let's yeah. just, if we, if you, you know, beyond all reasonable doubt we're there, good enough for us. You know? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and also setting up a situation that someone can design toward. That is, you know, you can once you set it up in, in, a, in a structure like this, and you remove it from the endless sort of questions of that philosophers love to discuss, which you know is a lot of fun, but it's not going to get us too far about uh, with you know building machines that can come closer and closer to thinking. So by framing it in this way, he's setting up uh, a kind of uh, open situation that uh, a person could try to design toward better and better programs. So, uh, uh, I mean, this is uh, certainly one of the one of the fundamental uh, goals here. So he uh, uh, he says a lot of things that uh, we are. Uh, familiar with today, but uh, at, at the time of uh, Turing's paper in 1950, the one I uh, asked you to read, um, this was, uh, you know, very fresh, very new. Uh, and the way he set this up is, uh, uh, be, came to be known as the Turing test. Anybody here ever been involved in a Turing test? Or? Okay. There, there are Turing test competitions every year. Uh, for building better and better uh, uh, programs that can actually get cl closer and closer to imitating uh, a uh, human being. Uh, all right, he, uh, he discusses some of the differences between machines and computing machines and organic entities. Can we call them organic machines? Uh, I mean, at least at some level, uh, and that is uh, he's very interested in, in, in sort of comparing these two types of entities because he feels that uh, by doing that uh, we get a better understanding of what we're, what we're considering. Uh, and so, uh, which is, you know, how can we build higher and higher performing machines that will uh, come closer and closer to being able to process information in, in ways that we would associate with thinking. Uh, he comes up with a number of objections, including, uh, so objections to machine thinking, including the theological, uh, Goodell's theorem and the mathematical ob objection, argument from consciousness. These are some of the ways in which uh, 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 people bring up uh, objections to machines being able to think. The theological objection, so what are, what are some of the ones, what are the th some of the things that he brings up? Uh, huh. I mean, for example, uh, the theological objection. This is simply that, uh, you know, humans have spiritual 
humans are spiritual entities and so forth, and machines cannot be made. That and thinking is part of that spiritual process, and uh, machines cannot be made that can uh, think and process thought, partly because they're just machines, and so uh, they don't have this special spirit. And uh, he he goes through each one of these. Uh, and more or less uh, gives his point of view, uh, which is, you know, it depends on what your definitions are. I mean, part of the paper is really dealing with definitions, is it not? I mean, what do we mean by thinking? I mean, we think we know what we mean when we say thinking, but uh, when you get down to trying to define it, Technically, you come in, you know, you, you run into problems. So he, he, he's trying to get at how can you structure a set of questions that would enable us to think about thinking. And as in many cases, engineering tends to be, a, has a tremendous uh, platform in which to investigate from engineering uh, problems deep problems that are connected to what we associate with the humanistic tradition. So engineering has a, a dialogue with many of these great problems and uh, uh, Turing in many ways is trying to create that dialogue here. He's, he's trying to begin to position these questions in ways in which we could get a better understanding of what we mean by thinking and in the process make better programs. I mean, that's, that's certainly his, his key goal here. So, uh, what else does he say about machines here? So to get a thinking machine, all right, so we have the imitation game. We can build better programs, um, and uh, you know, we can get uh, higher, a uh, uh, higher and higher degree of success with fooling people into thinking, or, uh, I don't know, fooling is, a, is, is quite the right word, but it seems to be appropriate, uh, into thinking that one of the entities that is not a human is actually performing like a human close enough that we can't tell it, can't tell the difference. How does he think that machines could be made that would be higher and higher performing? Again, it goes back to programs. The notion he comes up with a child uh, of the child machine. What does he mean by the child machine? Why? Yeah, Craig. Right. As uh, no human being with. Uh it's born almost, like it has some like basic kind of instinct and knowledge, yeah. but then as it grows up, it like picks up everything along with it and then becomes fully formed like a human. Okay. So it's through the process of learning, uh, rather than thinking of uh, designing something that performs at the level of uh, humans in terms of thinking, uh, why not design something that has a capacity, I mean, if machine learning is, 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 is a possibility, that has a capacity to learn and become more complicated? Because how do humans, and if you think of humans, uh, how do they acquire their ability to interact with their environment? Well, the most powerful uh, element here is the way in which they learn. We're back to Alice in Wonderland, you know, she's wandering through this, 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 this garden of uh, you know, bizarre entities and characters and so on, and she's interacting with her environment, and through that interaction, she's beginning to uh, get a deeper understanding of the world that she's part of. And, you know, when she says at the end of the, at the end of the, the fantasy, you're just a pack of cards. I mean, she's, she's kind of realized that she's outgrown that world in some ways. Because she's been interacting with it long enough to 
come to a comprehensive view of what it is. I mean, that's one explanation or one, one interpretation. So this child machine that Turing comes up with is a entity that uh, would be to uh, would would be able to learn, and uh, this connects with uh, Norbert Wiener's notion of uh, devices able to learn, devices that become more and more complicated in their interaction with their environments. So, what do you think of this theory? Make any sense, Charles? Kind of scary, though. In what way? Like, it makes you think about all the sci-fi movies where they have like little robot children. And <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. it, it's like I think this would only produce more problems. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure which, what kinds of problems this something like this would solve. Sure. And like the only problems that would come up would be problems that history has seen over and over again, mm -hmm. like. You would, it, you would essentially be creating a new kind of racial mm -hmm. identity, and then there would be strife mm -hmm. and just things like that. And mm -hmm. yeah, okay, I think it's a mess. that's that's fair enough. Yeah, so maybe it's not a good idea to build uh, computers that uh, can learn or at least form uh, perform at the high l level of function of thinking. Is that clear? do with that learning because when we learn things we often like we have the ability to connect it to other things that we have learned and that's where we generate new ideas mm -hmm. um, but with a computer you would need to program it to make those connections so mm -hmm. there would be a limit it's mm -hmm. like the number of connections it could make mm -hmm. so it may not be as dangerous necessarily as we think mm -hmm. just because it's not able just to I mean, I, I don't know if someone could program something to do this, but I guess you could have like a random <coughs> generator where it just connects like random things that it has acquired and then, mm -hmm. I don't, but yeah, I think it kind of depends on what kind of learning we're talking about. If it's just like simple fact by fact or if it's teaching it to somehow connect ideas. Okay. How does this connect with the biological world? What, what, what is it about... Uh Learning, learning machines that connects with bi biology. Because mm. biology is all kind of feedback response, I guess, mm -hmm. where the, the, program, the child machine is going to get whatever stimulus and it's going to okay. learn from it. So then the next time it comes around, it'll say, oh, I've encountered this chair before, I can't walk through the chair, I have to walk around the chair or over the chair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The same way uh, an animal that encounters something like that would, but also in a more evolutionary standpoint, uh, the child machine evolves. Maybe the first time it walked into the chair and broke, mm -hmm. next time it's going to walk around the chair, same way uh, an evolutionary adaptation is going to keep uh, an animal from dying in a circumstance. Mm -hmm. Live next time yeah. yeah, organisms have a very, very complex relation with their environment that involves learning. Uh, learning is one of the key ways in which uh, even very, very simple organisms can actually, through a series of trial and error processes, uh, build a certain kind of uh, basis for more, ac more uh, effective interaction with their environments. So it, it brings up this whole realm of uh, machine learning, brings up this whole question of uh, organic entities that learn. So if only for that, just understanding a little bit more about machine learning can tell us something about life forms and the way in which <laughs> they learn and interact with their environments, and perhaps vice versa. Devin, did you have? Um, <clears throat> um, um, quite a number of people have argued, too, that this kind of technological adaptation is very much a part of our, our own biological and especially cultural mm -hmm. evolution and that you know 
as, as we move forward, it's only natural that you know you have the industrial revolution and then you start to build computers and the, the next step will be these machines that are very much like us. And that instead of looking at it from the perspective of that these, these you know, overlords are going to kill us all, that this is slowly what we are becoming. There's, there's this kind of cybernetic human machine symbiosis and that assuming we don't kill ourselves off with, with the atmosphere and whatever beforehand, will have reached this kind of hybrid where it won't make a difference what one or the other mm -hmm. is anymore. Um, yeah, so. yeah it, it's absolutely true that humans are, are becoming more and more integrated with, with uh, their devices. I mean, uh, we all spend huge amounts of time during the day interacting with uh, various kinds of uh, com computational regimes. Uh, and you know, some people have uh, extensions of their own functions through mechanical devices. Most people do, at least at the level of you know using things to get around and move, and you know all the practical things we do in life are machine supported. Uh, but it's also come to the point that certain people have become more closely integrated limbs. People have had terrible accidents, things of that sort, uh, mechanical devices that can, quote, think or interact in a more uh, precise way with their environments can also benefit humans who have, you know, uh, uh, tremendous need. So obviously that's one of the, you know, uh, whether we're, we should de develop something that would uh, in some way be in competition with this, that you know, that is not what most people who work in these areas are, are really have in mind. Uh, I gave you a little uh, clip here. I don't know if anybody saw Space, o uh, Space Odyssey. If you look at this clip, this is the uh, I gave you the clip from Hell, where he's on. Uh, terrifying, terrifying clip. <laughs> <laughs> It was, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a film that was really ahead of its time and it, 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 uh, wonderful. And certainly uh, uh, it was, it was uh, Kubrick had in mind uh, Turing. I mean, some of this concept of these, you know, teaching the child machine to learn. Chris. I was going to say about the frontier researchers on the subject, but I've spoken to some grad students studying computational biology, and they say that machine learning is like the hottest topic in the field right now. Mm -hmm. And that, that getting a machine to perhaps imitate the, the, the mechanisms of an organ or a, a small like mm -hmm. cell is, is what is, is really attractive to them right now and is what they're trying to do. Yeah. Well, biological engineering is now a department at MIT. I mean, there are a lot of people here who are in, you know, for good reason. They're, they're looking for ways to create uh, all kinds of devices that help people uh, interact with their environments. Uh, both people who, are, uh, who have disabilities, but also people who have all sorts of different kinds of uh, uh, goals that are you know, research-oriented. Research um, Intelligent machines can be uh, an incredible resource. Uh, you know, when you have catastrophes and things that, you know, where a mechanical device in an environment can function at, uh, more effectively than a human. Um, so yeah, there, 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 there are lots and lots of uh, things that people are interested in developing intelligent machines for. Devin, yeah. In that, in that clip, you'll you'll see that uh, Dave is slowly, you know, turning the turning the screw, and, and these little, you know, yeah. these little like kind of glass chips come out, and Hal's mind slowly starts to go. And one of the things I thought of with that is, imagine, you know, should we begin to merge more with these kinds yeah. of machines? That so much of our problem now is is one of ignorance and lack of perspective. And yeah, that yeah. you know, I live so far away from the person across the globe, <coughs> I have no idea what their concerns or interests are. But suddenly, imagine. A world viewer perspective able to be sent over a network in a second, mm -hmm. and you know suddenly when you have this kind of integration between machines, so much of the limitations of our own minds and our own yeah. our, our limitations of our own bodies become yeah. meaningless. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it, it, it the, on the I understand the the issue of there could be a problem with this whole idea, but on the on the plus side, this kind of 
integration of, of community too, mm -hmm. way beyond Twitter and Facebook, has mm -hmm. the potential to be one of the only things that might actually save us in the long run. Mm -hmm. so. no, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, a absolutely. There are, there are ways of interacting that are uh, constantly being improved, and you know, there's a there's a uh, there's a potential of reaching a goal where people communicate far more effectively and understand each other with much greater uh, comprehensiveness. And so those are, those are goals that I think everybody agrees are potentially uh, hugely uh, advantageous. All right, so yeah, I, we don't have time to, uh, but you know, if, if you haven't seen the, the film, it's a wonderful film because it, I mean, it, it really talks about the way in which uh, it, it really shows the uh, even even in, in uh, 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 in that regime how human and, and computing are completely integrated, and certainly for all of the space shuttles and all of the things that we do, intelligent machines enable us to do that. I mean, when we send somebody out into outer space uh, for whatever purpose, uh, the support level that they have from highly functioning machines is, is tremendous. We couldn't do it without. <coughs> so Kubrick really uh, captures that, that whole regime. Um, all right, so he... Uh, he talks about evolutionary, he kind of works out an evolutionary structure here for these machines. Uh, I'm not sure that I uh, myself totally agree with this, but uh, he says the structure of the child machine, uh, the structure itself is a hereditary material. So that's the, uh, and he makes this, the parallel of changes uh, of the child, uh, changes of the child machine, things that alter it. Are forms of uh, uh, are, are parallel to mutation, and then uh, natural selection is the judgment of the experimenter. Whether so, this is his kind of set of parallels for. Uh, but it is interesting that he's trying to draw this parallel between uh, machine interaction and learning, and the, the process of natural selection. Trimming. Uh, Wiener sort of set it up that way too. Uh, he he talked about uh, the trimming process and machine learning, uh, and he's talking about machines uh, a little earlier. Uh, but uh, this is uh, this is the same parallel that uh, uh, Turing has here. Uh, he mentions Helen Keller. How's Helen Keller relevant? Anybody know the story of Helen Keller? Yeah, sure. She was, she was, uh, like she was disabled. No. Wait, she was the the child, right? Yeah, she. Um, she was like terribly disabled, and so like I guess in many ways, like, how do you teach a child that's not normal, and how do you teach a child when there is like a lot of there was like a huge gap of communication. Her senses were yeah. yeah. She she uh, she was blind and she was basically she everything. Was so she had no means of uh, interacting with her environment. And so why, how is this a parallel? What, what, what kind of parallel is Turing uh, bringing up here? With the child machine, it can't see the world the way we see it. Right. It can't perceive the world the way we have, perceive it no. through our senses because no. it doesn't have our senses. Uh, and so in a lot of ways that's like like you, in teaching Helen Keller you probably have to like the teacher probably had to build a way for her to perceive the world and obviously yeah. even after her education she's going to perceive the world differently yeah and that's probably the she goal became a, a, a highly functioning person who wrote extensively uh, was politically very very active uh, uh, absolutely brilliant and yet she had built up all her basic knowledge without the aid of hearing or sight. And so this is a powerful example of the potential of learning when you don't have the sensorium. 
and uh, uh, so it's it, it's a kind of parallel that uh, he he brings in simply to make people think a little more deeply about you know what can you do when you don't have the the total apparatus that a learning child has, uh, and the answer is uh, an incredible uh, a lot. Yeah, Devin. Tell her story. From what I remember, what she had this pretty <coughs> remarkable teacher who yeah. kind of saw promise in her, you know, at an early age, and was benevolent and remarkably supportive in continuing as an experiment or trying to find ways to be able to open up this channel of communication. And in no small part, Helen Keller's success was due to this woman whose name I can't remember. And one of the things we can carry over to that here is that you know. He uses the word experimenter there, but it really, it really yeah. ought to be more like parent because it requires a kind of benevolence in that you yeah. really want this program to yeah. succeed or yes. to be able to thrive, and you're, so you're going to have this vested interest in trying to help it yeah. along. Yeah. You know, so this is this is definitely true. Uh, yeah, her teacher. I, I don't remember the name of her teacher, but her teacher had a whole approach to uh, teaching where she used the sense of touch to associate with uh, uh, certain objects. And she could communicate those through language, uh, uh, interacting uh, with Keller. And uh, you know, she built up uh, this whole vocabulary and understanding through this kind of very simple process of input. But as you say, the teacher was totally devoted to her. Uh, and had been successful in, in teaching other people, other children who had uh, lost their uh, sight and hearing. So, but it 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 it, it certainly is a, a a tremendous example of what, with very limited resources and capabilities, what complexity you can you can achieve. Um, and again, it it it. Quite apart from the uh, the ultimate goals, it, it tells us so much more about learning, what learning is. What are we talking about? It, it helps us get down to our assumptions. What do we think about? And so uh, talking about computers thinking is a great way to kind of explore what we mean by thinking. I mean, maybe by thinking, certainly Searle, who uh, who does not think the Turing test is uh, a uh, even if even if uh, succeeded in is, is proof of thinking? Uh, I mean, he has a whole definition of thinking that ev uh, that involves intentionality. I mean, and, uh, uh, so John Searle was uh, was a, an opponent of this this style of uh, uh, out of, the, uh, out of this style of thinking came artificial intelligence and some of the, the concepts of early artificial intelligence and, and uh, hard, hard AI and soft AI and so on. And Searle uh, challenged that because he felt that no matter what level of uh, function you can achieve through your programming, you can't create what a organism has that intends to do something. There's no kind of uh, intention in the machine to do something. It's simply manipulating symbols. Uh, we'll look at the Searle paper later. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the value of that is we begin to have a discussion, what, you know, about what we mean when we say thinking and what we mean when we say education. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think <coughs> education. I also think of like values and morals, mm -hmm. and I, yeah. I always I think that our actions are based upon our morals. Yeah. So, would when it says educating machine, would that also mean putting instilling morals into? Great that question. Morals? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should uh, if we want to talk about education in the comprehensive sense. So. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very valid question. No, I, I thought my list. <laughs> Every scissor hands is a great 
take on that idea. Yeah. Um, in 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 what way? Well, in, in Edward Edward Scissorhands, as the movie begins, there's this lone inventor up in his you know up in his castle or whatever, and he's working on on this wonderful machine, and you know, he, but. He, uh, and he's sitting, you know, the opening scene, he's sitting there and he's telling it stories and fables and relating to it morals and talking about, you know, what is good and what is not and all of this. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, the, the, uh, the inventor dies before he's able to complete Edward, and as a result, that's you know, why his hands are all temporary. But as the whole point of the movie is Edward, who has learned how, you know, been taught, as we're all supposed to be taught, to be this morally correct, you know, mm -hmm. but artificial being, and he goes down into what seems like the perfect little town, you know, where all these, you know, absolutely religious, morally right, righteous people live. And he realizes that he's different and suddenly that he doesn't understand because all the morals he's been taught don't seem to apply to all of these other people. And it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful social commentary on so much of us and yeah. what, we, and what we, do, us. we do. Yeah, that's, so. that's great, yeah. Yeah, and in some <coughs> in some uh, similar uh, in in some similar ways, uh, 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 Frankenstein and the whole yeah, Mary the Mary Shelley's story, because the the uh, the being that is created in the laboratory has been created out of the stuff of uh, you know corpses and things of that sort, but it has come to life. But it is also a much more complicated being than uh, so the monster turns out to be you know a individual who thinks who is uh, understands certain kinds of moral complexities and uh, and it turns out that uh, you know the human response is so over the top or uh, well not over the top because you know it's, it's fairly natural for people to fear something uh, as different and, and strange as uh, the monster, but uh, you know, it, it, the story gets very, very complicated because of these questions of morals and how does this all figure into the mechanical uh, complexity that we want to associate with a uh, thinking machine. Hal, it turns out, uh, in the, the movie clip, uh, his problem is he's incredibly logical and he wants to achieve his end and when he thinks that there may be a chance for the mission to be shut down you know he's programmed to go and he doesn't so he starts eliminating people who uh, begin to uh, question the mission so it becomes necessary to get rid of Hal and so Hal doesn't want to be got rid of so this kind of tension develops between this computer that doesn't really have the moral comprehension to realize that uh, it should shut itself down or it, it shouldn't oppose uh, a decision that's being made on, on, uh, that may conflict with his own. So it's an interesting, uh, again, it brings up these questions. These are big questions. And they connect back to Wiener, too. You know, when we, when we design things, you know, are we fully aware of what we're creating and what the impacts are? And, you know, we have to, we have to try to uh, do this with uh, a kind of comprehensive understanding of uh, the effects. Okay, I, uh, I just thought it would be interesting to uh, mention here uh, Joe Weizenbaum who used to be here at MIT, and uh, he's a very talented uh, uh, computer scientist who d devised the first, uh, uh, one of the first uh, conversational agents, chatterbots. You've all interacted with chatterbots many, many times. I'm sure, you know, when you have to call a bank or you have to call someplace and you start interacting with uh, a voice that you can tell is a, uh, a fabricated voice. Uh, you're aware that you're in this world. But uh, uh, Weizenbaum uh, created this ELISA program. I've given you the link here. If you want to play around with it, you can actually have a conversation with ELISA. This link goes to a, 
a little dialogue box and you can say, hello, Eliza, how are you today? And, you know, she'll answer, uh, thank you for getting, uh, thank you for, uh, thank you, or something like that. <coughs> how can I help you? And then you sort of, you can tell her about, I don't know, your mother or your father or, you know, or your family, or you can interact over various things and you can develop a kind of a little dialogue that goes on. You know, Eliza isn't that complicated, but she is, a, she is capable of uh, having a conversation. And what I like to do is see how complicated a conversation I can try to build with. Because you can try to, you know, if you get too complicated, then it sort of becomes, it just, the whole thing becomes very obvious that it's just a, uh, but so one of the things to do is just try to keep the conversation going as long as you can and try to see how much complexity you can build into the conversation as you interact with this agent. It's actually, it's fun. You can kind of fool around with it for 20 minutes if you're you know, bored or uh, you need a break. So yeah, and, and more and more complicated uh, uh, agents have, uh, autonomous conversational agents have been developed. So, you know, you can get on your telephone and have conversations all over. I mean, the, the value of these is quite considerable, uh, chatterbots, because, uh, you know, people otherwise have to be there. So you can, uh, instead of having somebody who's just answering the same question over and over again, you can put one of these agents in and, uh, you know, it, it eliminates the job. Uh, not that we're trying to eliminate jobs uh, for everybody, but uh, there are other things that can be done by people better. And uh, okay, so this was, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Joe Weizenbaum passed away recently, but he was a, uh, an MIT computer scientist. I remember reading a quote somewhere, and I mean, you've been backing up on this. I was going to mention this a couple of classes ago. I think he was the guy who actually said that, you know, despite all this license, because a lot of people got excited about yeah. it, he's like, Don't, nobody get excited about this because it's just a this toy. Is true. And he says, not, I think he went so far as to say, not only that, he, and he gave reasons why, but that the development of a strong, real AI is sinful and a crime against humanity. He it shouldn't yeah. be, you know. This is a very good point. He wrote a book called uh, Computer Power and Human Reason. And in that book, he, he said, you know, it, it, was a, it was a kind of a barren project to try to develop uh, machines that we, uh, that, that can think. And so he was quite alienated from this whole, and so he was, uh, he, you know, he, he certainly, <coughs> and, and part of it came from the fact that he developed this program and he saw people in his office and so forth interacting with it as though it were real. And he was kind of astonished. He thought, you know, he, he was astonished by the fact that uh, people would actually attribute the complexity of humans to something as simple as this little program that he developed. And so uh, he became quite uh, uh, concerned about this. So he took some time off. He wrote this big book. Uh, in which he argued that, uh, you know, this was the idea of artificial intelligence achieving anything similar to humans was, uh, you know, not only a, a, a silly idea, but also a morally bad idea that humans should not try to, try to uh, pursue this line of... So in some ways he's a... <clears throat> he's 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 similar in some ways in his positions uh, to Norbert Wiener. You know, Wiener had certain reservations about developing certain types of technologies. So yeah, he he was a he was a very a very uh, interesting and an important figure. Uh, and then he uh, I, I know he retired and I think he returned. I think he I think he went to Germany and. I think that's where he passed away. But he was, uh, he was around when I came to MIT. I met him several times. Very nice guy. Very involved in social action and uh, very sort of concerned to, uh, you know, find uh, 
social uh, reasons for developing technologies. Okay, so any further thoughts on Alan Turing? I just wanted you to glance through the paper, read it, uh, and realize that this is kind of a, uh, a line of thinking that has come through this, this group of uh, writers that we've been uh, talking about. So next class, we're going to go back into the 19th century, and we're going to read uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And that is a work that sort of brings up all kinds of evolutionary tales and topics and questions. So we'll start on that on Monday. Uh, any questions about papers? Is anybody planning? I think, David, you said you might come by on Saturday. Yeah. Is anybody else? Okay. If you think you're going to drop by on Saturday, uh, let me know. Okay, you can send me an email. Okay, great. Do you think the other, uh, do you think that Mr. Jackson? Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Do you think that, I, because I actually didn't know about the, I didn't know too much about the Enigma code portion of yeah, Turing's yeah, yeah. life, and do you think the, the this idea of using one machine to, you know, interpret the output of another as a potential inspiration for Turing equivalence. Yeah. Like because it, it's it just it kind of seems like that that could be. It seems to me that way. Yes, it, it does. He's helping guide him, kind of on that idea that oh, that's right. The interpreter for a program is just another program, yeah, you yeah. know, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's my that's my take on it. Is that he got interested in designing more and more powerful machines that could uh, interact with other machines, but in some sense absorb them and comprehend them yeah. or become more comprehensive. So this idea that you could begin to develop a progression of, of more and more uh, of, of machines that function at higher and higher levels. So it developed, he, he developed this concept of, uh, of uh, you know, sort of uh, progressions in programs and also in machine design. Uh, I mean, he focuses in the paper on programs, and he realizes that more and more powerful programs will continually be built. So this is a notion of machine that's, uh, I mean, there was the notion of, yeah, machines get better, they get smaller, they get, I mean, Butler had that in his uh, chapters on Book of the Machines, that, you know, machines become smaller and smaller, and, you know, they, they can still carry out the same functions. So he had this notion that, yeah, machines advance. So that notion of machines evolving reaches a kind of a new level with uh, digital computers and programming because the whole concept of machines that can maybe even begin to learn. Uh, and so some of the terms that were used were like uh, emulation machines or universal machines. Uh, and this captured the notion that uh, computers could really be designed to uh, emulate almost anything. And I think yes, you even saw it in one of your slides. He ascribes no particular importance to concurrency, and you know it's that if you're if if you're building a universe inside of a machine, and you need a bunch of things to simultaneously be updated, be updated at the same time. The remarkable thing about these computers is that you can make time work however you want. Mm -hmm. So if you if you have the internal clock of the computer spinning at a multiple of the clock of the universe that you're, you're trying to build, mm -hmm. then suddenly in between the first tick of the clock in the universe and the second tick, you can update everything in the system by the computer's clock and still have everything be effectively concurrent. And that's an amazing idea. Interesting, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's fascinating, you know, and you can, <laughs> from there you can get into relativistic physics or whatever you want. It's just that, like, in, if anyone wants to go see it, this isn't a von Neumann style computer, I think, but if you go to Harvard and you go to the science building, and you walk in on the first floor, in the back, you'll just see this giant oh, yeah. green machine. That is the Harvard Mark I, which was like mm -hmm. just an amazing, mm -hmm. Harvard's kind of take on, well, well, well I think whatever, when I was in New Jersey or whatever, 
these were the people at Harvard were working, which was a slightly different idea in terms of architecture, but yeah, obviously yeah, did yeah. the same kind of work. Yeah. So if anyone wants to see one of those giant room-sized computers, go take a look there. That's great. That's yeah, uh, yeah. Many universities produce these. Uh, Manchester in England, uh, MIT was working. Uh, Jay Forster was working on uh, uh, a uh, magnetic memory core for uh, digital computers uh, in Project Whirlwind. Um, there were f uh, projects at Harvard. Harvard did a lot of development of early computing. Uh, and the Advanced Institute at Princeton is where von Neumann was. And uh, he tried to talk, uh, I, I just read in some, that uh, Turing passed through there and spent some time at the Advanced Institute. And von Neumann tried to get him to stay. He didn't. He didn't want to. Uh, yeah, and and Turing's own life was yeah, it, it was kind of tragic because uh, at that time, the governments uh, felt that it had you know some kind of uh, uh, moral authority to ask him to uh, do things harmful to him because they felt that his uh, homosexuality was somehow a threat to national security. And uh, you know, Turing was a brilliant individual, but he, didn't, he couldn't stand up to that kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, governmental mm, intrusion. So it, it ultimately uh, ended in his suicide. So that was a very very uh, dismal tale, because he did so much for the war effort. I mean, his, his cracking of uh, the uh, German code was uh, single-handedly made the war uh, effort, uh, uh, advance the war effort, probably more than anything, any other single thing. Um, anyway, complicated world.